Greetings. I'm Glenn Wharton, Chair of the UCLA Getty Interdepartmental Program in the Conservation of Cultural Heritage. Welcome to another event in our Distinguished Lecture Series. UCLA is a land-grant institution, and we acknowledge the Gabrielino Tongva peoples as tradi the traditional land caretakers of the Tovan Gar, the Los Angeles Basin and South Channel Islands. We honor the elders, past and present, and the descendants who are part of the Gabrielino Tongva nation. We honor and respect the many first peoples still connected to the land on which we gather, and, and we commit our work and service to these values. In this lecture series, we invite leaders in allied fields to reflect on larger issues of cultural heritage conservation, which span from technical research and intervention on cultural materials to larger concerns such as authenticity, illicit trade, repatriation, and protection during times of war. Many of us have been looking forward to today's lecture by Dr. Ihor Hoshivailo, who will tell us about the current situation in Ukraine with regards to the Russian theft and destruction of Ukrainian cultural heritage. He'll also explore some of the motivations behind these acts. Given the large size of the audience, we won't be able to take live questions during our discussion following the lecture. But if you do have questions, please post them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to get to some of them. Um, and we'll certainly pass them all on to our speaker after the event. We will record the lecture and post it on our website for those who are unable to attend. Today's event is co-sponsored by the Center for European and Russian Studies at UCLA. Lori Hart, director of the center and professor of anthropology and global studies will introduce our speaker. But first I'd like to point out that Dr. Hart is a sociocultural anthropologist with a research focus on the long-term effects of persons and communities who've experienced ethno-political conflict. With this background, she'll no doubt enrich our discussion following the lecture. Lori? Good morning, everyone, and thanks for being here with us. And thank you, Glenn, for and the UCLA Getty Conservation Program for inviting our participation in this event. This is a moment to do everything we can to keep Ukraine um, in our awareness and in our consciousness uh, as the war continues into its 14 month, 14th month. We are increasingly aware of the depth of the toll of material and human destruction and the severity of the threats to democracy and freedom and the environmental, bodily, social, and psychological costs of war. We urgently need to keep international attention focused. We're really fortunate to have with us this morning a speaker who's been a core actor in the struggle for the preservation of cultural memory and material heritage in Ukraine. Ihor Poshivailo is a cultural activist, ethnologist, museologist, cultural manager, and art curator. Dr. Poshibailo is a former chairman of the Museum Council at the Ukrainian Ministry of Culture, a former vice chair of the International Committee on Disaster Resilient Museums at the International Committee on Museums. He holds a PhD in history and was a Fulbright scholar at the Smithsonian Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage and an international fellow at the DeVos Institute of Arts Management at the Kennedy Center. He is general director of the National Memorial to the Heavenly Hundred Heroes and Revolution of Dignity Museum, also called the Maidan Museum. That museum was founded in the aftermath of the 2013-2014 rebellion against government corruption and pro-Russian autocracy that cost the lives of 108 protesters and 13 police and reestablished the constitution in Ukraine. Its aim was, and I quote Dr. Poshivailo's words here, to carve out, quote, a space of freedom, a public space of a new type, a place of vivid stories and true accounts, a repository of collective memory and laboratory of its reinterpretation. From, 19, uh, from 2014 to the present, he and his colleagues have sought to sustain this vision under the continuous violence and plunder of war. Please join me in welcoming Ihor Poshivailo. Ihor. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm pleased and honored to join the University of Los Angeles because uh, serious program. And thank you 
for this great opportunity. Uh, let me start. Um, uh, let me start uh, my, maybe not lecture, I would like to have a, a talk, a discussion on the situation, what's going on in Ukraine uh, concerning this dramatic uh, war, which we often name as identity war because cultural heritage, cultural sector are um, the main targets uh, in this situation. So, uh, on February 22, explosions woke me up in Kyiv. It was quite an easy situation because Ukraine was not prepared. Also, the war started in 2014, in fact. Uh, Russian missiles, airstrikes, and tank fires targeted not only my family and my nation. Uh, they targeted our cultural identity, our centuries old heritage. Thus began a full scale war that became a turning point, not only for Ukraine, but for the whole of the world. Despite all the narratives spread by Russian propaganda, the real motive behind Russia's war is quite clear. They're trying to destroy Ukraine as a sovereign state and eliminate the Ukrainian people as an independent and free nation. So why did all this unprovoked and unfair full scale aggression happen? Um, I will repeat Lori, but uh, let me start by saying that it, it is deeply symbolic for us in Ukraine that the great Nelson Mandela ended his earthly life exactly at the time when the Kyiv Euromaidan protest, or Maidan briefly, was setting up its first barricades on the other continent in the heart of Europe. According to Paul Goebbels' evaluation of Euromaidan, a new nation was born in Ukraine with intrinsic political belief in democracy and liberty. This American analyst believes that the name of the Ukrainian experience of national genesis, Maidan, or the square, is a reminiscence of the ancient Greek agora, a public space where people's assembly would develop the principles uh, of people's authority, spreading democracy all over the world. Here's another symbol quite gloomy considering our present situation. In 1961, uh, Moscow leader Nikita Khrushchev declared that Russian missiles would destroy Acropolis in Athens if necessary for achievement of Russian goals. The Greek prime minister of that time replied to the Kremlin dictator that Moscow could destroy the Acropolis with its weapons, but would never be able to destroy the idea of democracy and personal freedom that had been born there. So the Euromaidan revolution was the first response to Russia's open aggression towards Ukraine in 2014. The biggest and longest in European history protests destroyed Moscow's plans to seize Ukraine stealthily, quietly, through political collaborators at the highest level of government and using hybrid technologies. So in the days following the corrupted President Yanukovych escape, Russia attempted to split Ukraine, making it look like a civil war and occupied by part of its territory. By invading Crimea on February 2014, Russia started an, an armed war against Ukraine. The Netsk and Lugansk regions have turned into a long-term zone of temporary occupation and military actions. In the response, the Maidan was transformed into a powerful volunteer movement in support of the Ukrainian armed forces. Many of the protesters replaced wooden shields and makeshift ammunition for bulletproof body armor and fire weapons and set out to defend the country. 
The National Memorial to the Heavenly Hundred and the Revolution of Dignity Museum, or briefly the Maidan Museum, has progressed from a public initiative to a state-run institution to become an important symbol of the national memory, freedom of rights, and cultural expressions. We planned to launch the construction of the Maidan Museum in the very heart of Kyiv this year. The six-story building with a total space of over 300,000 square feet is conceptualized as a multifunctional space with not only exhibitions to display historical narratives, but with House of Freedom, a children's museum, creative laboratories, art studios, and platforms to experiment, generate new senses and perspectives, develop cultural and civil activism. Since uh, Crimea and part of Donbass were occupied by Russia in 2014, it was a crucial need for cultural activists in Ukraine to obtain broader knowledge on various aspects of emergency response and resilience on the cultural sector to build capacities, strengthen communities and inspire them with a hope for sustainable future. You can see the first museums which were damaged in the summer of 2014 in Luhansk and Donetsk regions. And in this situation, of course, we needed uh, much more knowledge. We needed to understand how world response to such situations. And so in particular, we, uh, in 2014, uh, have established a museum emergency headquarters, which however did not exist for long as the conflict was localized in Eastern Ukraine. And nobody believed that it would be fueled into a full scale invasion. And you can see on, on the slide, uh, some guidelines, toolkits, which we transformed, adopted, translated uh, due to international standards and practices. And you can see some from the United States, some European um, publications, which became very, very instrumental and very helpful to us in that very first moments when we had to respond. But still, it was not uh, systematic. And unfortunately, Ukraine was not ready to effectively protect its cultural heritage due to the lack of relevant knowledge, resources, coordination, and most importantly, awareness at the highest levels of the role of cultural heritage and Ukrainian identity in this war. So Putin's regime ignored uh, the basic international military and humanitarian laws, including the Hague Convention of 1954 and its protocols on the protection of cultural property in the event of armed conflict, not spontaneously, uh, due to so-called military necessity. The desire to reboot the cultural identity of Ukrainians was at the core of the Kremlin's genocidal policy. Uh, the Guardian uh, journalist uh, Luke Harding aptly observed that Putin sought to satisfy his political ambitions of enslaving language and identity by using tactics familiar and tested from Russia's dark past. So bombs, destruction, and killings of civilians. Quite illustrative evidences. And really, uh, why not? As Putin cynically declared a few days before the full-scale attack that Ukraine is an alienable part of Russian history, culture, and spiritual space. And uh, Russia uses not only history, but also culture as a tool of their imperial policy. This was clearly expressed uh, by the director of the Hermitage and president of the ICOM Russia, Mikhail Piotrovsky last summer. Speaking about the importance of culture in this aggression, he emphasized in his interview, uh, the exhibitions abroad by Hermitage were a powerful cultural offensive, a kind of a special operation. So it was very similar to military operation um, announced uh, by Kremlin regime. The result of such like offensive uh, speak for themselves. During 408 days of the war, uh, 13, over 1300 objects of cultural infrastructure in Ukraine were damaged. 
including over 500 destroyed, completely destroyed. Uh, this statistics is according to the Ministry of Culture and Informational Policy. And you can see how many hundreds of cultural centers, historical buildings, religious, uh, religious sites, monuments, libraries, museums, theaters, and philharmonics have been damaged or destructed. Uh, before the war, the cultural sector of Ukraine was quite big. It, it was consisted of about 40,000 institutions in which more than 200,000 people worked. Of them, more than 7% are occupied at the moment and about 2% were destroyed or damaged. And this resulted in about 12,000 cultural workers becoming forcibly displaced. More than 600 of them are serving in the armed forces and 80,000 becoming unemployed. Also, uh, some statistics about the scale of the damage. According to a few days ago, UN estimations, the war caused damage to Ukraine's heritage and cultural sites of approximately 2.6 billion US dollars. Dramatic pictures of the destroyed heritage sites, historical buildings, museums, memorial, memorials, churches, mosques, and synagogues, cultural and art centers became world known. And uh, of course, the scale of destruction shocked even US President Joseph Biden, who called the war in Ukraine brutal and added that Putin is not only trying to take over Ukraine, he's trying to destroy the culture and the identity of the Ukrainian people. Here you can see some iconic examples of the cultural damage, starting from the Mariupol Drama Theater where hundreds of residents tried to escape Russian air bombing, but in vain, they put the signs in front and beside this building, uh, children in the big letter so that the aircrafts with bombs can see um, about 600 people are, re are reported at the moment to be killed during the, the, those airstrikes. One more example, uh, you can see here, uh, one of the first destroyed wooden churches dated 1862 in uh, the Zhitomyr region and the history museum in the town of Okhtyrka in the Sumer region on the left. The official statistics by the Ministry of Culture and Informational Policy, of course, uh, is shocking, but incomplete as Ukraine has no access to temporarily occupied territories. It cannot assess the range of damage there. Therefore, a satellite laboratories of the USA and Great Britain help to monitor the condition of cultural objects, providing information from regions temporary uh, not under the control of Ukraine and documenting the facts of intentional attacks on heritage. A vivid example is the monitoring of Ukraine's over 30,000 cultural objects by the Smithsonian Institution and the Cultural Monitoring Lab in Virginia. And uh, there is an urgent need for this, of course, for this monitoring, satellite monitoring, and um, according to one of our partners, Brian Daniels, and uh, an anthropologist and director of research uh, and programs at uh, the Center for Cultural Heritage at the University of Pennsylvania Museum, uh, he also works with the Smithsonian Heritage Rescue Initiative and the Heritage Monitoring Laboratory at the Virginia Museum of Natural History. And we got a lot of information about intentional uh, damage of a number of Ukrainian uh, cultural heritage sites and museums in particular. And according to uh, Brian Daniels, uh, Russian thefts of artifacts in Ukraine is a strategy to undermine the identity of Ukraine as a separate in independent country. This evidence is also confirmed by other sources, official statements of representatives of the military civilian administration, private and public social networks, materials in the media, reports of cultural workers, and even information from the occupied territories. So on October 14, 2022, the Russian media Izvestia 
published an article about the so-called replenishment of the Museum Fund of Russia by 44,000 works of art with a total value of over a billion rubles. And of course, all that artworks are from are, are looted from, uh, from Ukrainian territory. It's also important that it seems all the world understands that the destruction um, of, of Ukrainian culture becomes an object of war. And it's so special in the case of Russia's attack on, on, on Ukraine. And uh, Richard Curin, the former undersecretary of the Smithsonian Institution, uh, clearly put it in his article, which was published in the Smithsonian Magazine about the cultural dis destruction in Ukraine. So uh, the war crimes against culture were enlarged by looting and illegal trafficking of cultural objects from Ukrainian museums and private collections to non-controlled territories and to the Russian Federation. The cases of looting collections from the Mariupol Art and History Museum and Kuinji Art Gallery and Melitopol Museum are illustrative and so dramatic. As soon as Mariupol was captured, the occupants uh, hauled away the original paintings of Arhip Kuinji and Ivana Ivazovsky, unique icons and other valuable exhibits from local museums. The Mariupol Museum of Local Law was destroyed by shelling and almost all of its stock collection burned in the fire, except rarities uh, that were illegally relocated to Russia. Uh, one more example, uh, Yuhim Harabet's unique collection of over 700 exhibits was also stolen from the unique Museum of Medallion Art in Mariupol. In the occupied Melitopol, Russians hunted for Scythian gold and archaeological collections of the fourth century BC at the local history museum. Its employees were kidnapped as its director, Leila Ibrahimova, and interrogated with tortures. As a result, historical weapons and about 2,000 items made of silver and gold were stolen, including about 200 pieces of golden jewelry from the Melitopol uh, Scythian Mount, uh, fourth century BC, and about 100 golden items of the Hunic and Sarmatian period, third, fifth centuries AD. Russians also looted dozens of thousands of exhibits from the museums in the Kherson region. Among them, almost all the paintings from the Kherson Art Museum, including the most valuable dated 17th, 19th centuries, including unique icons. Paradox, uh, but they left intact only some of the social realism paintings and 20th century artworks by local artists. The Kherson Museum of Local Law also lost about 10,000 artworks of its collection, including lapidary, archeology, span and historical jewelry. Some details of such like Russian special operation in Kherson, uh, according to the witnesses of that situation, the museum collections were looted by specially organized teams of dozens of people. Uh, about a half dozen trucks come to the museum to relocate the collections. Uh, they organized a kind of a security and constructed special roadblocks around the building so not many people can see what's going on. And at the same time, according to some witnesses, they disregarded elementary museum norms during this so-called operation, loading artistic values objects as ordinary load, like ordinary objects. Interesting that uh, some of the stolen items were taken to temporary occupied Crimea and uh, some of them, uh, in, in particular paintings, from the Kherson Art Museum were identified at the Tavrida Central Museum in Simferopol. And in this uh, slides, you can see this looted artworks just stole in corridors of the museum in temporary occupied uh, Crimea. There are so many such facts. And uh, this once again confirms the systematic attack on Ukrainian identity in the context of so-called de-Ukrainization proclaimed by Russia. Putin demonstrated his readiness and willingness to repeat the crimes of Peter I, 
Catherine II, Lenin, Stalin, and other leaders of Russian imperialism and dictatorship. Genocide by repressions, starvation by hunger or warfare. Thus, not only the looting of Ukrainian historical, cultural, and artistic values, but also the intentional destruction of museums, archives, libraries, theaters, cultural centers, monuments, religious buildings, is a carefully planned military and ideological operation of the Putin regime. An intentional missile attack on the Ivankiv Museum, also reported to be as the first intentionally destructed museum in Kyiv region, uh, with a unique collection of works of naive painting, including of the fam world famous Maria Primachenko, whose paintings were admired by Pablo Picasso, as well as the Hrihori Skavarda Museum, very, very symbolic, iconic museum and person for Ukrainian uh, culture and history in the Kharkiv region, has been confirmed by international uh, experts. Such like crimes against humanity are carefully documented by law enforcement officers, uh, military prosecutors office, advocacy groups, volunteers, uh, and uh, with only one hope uh, that early or later, uh, all these documents will bring uh, the perpetrators of cultural genocide in Ukraine to the tribunal. Uh, from the first days of massive missile strikes, Ukrainian museum libraries and archives and other cultural institutions responded to the threats through their capabilities and the military situation. Some have started the evacuation of cultural values, but for others, uh, unfortunately, it was already too late. The territories were occupied the same day on the 24th, on the 25th of February. At the same time, uh, cultural activists in cooperation with local authorities and communities turned public spaces into cultural barricades, sheltering monuments and sculptures, facade decorations, and other artistic and historical objects with OSB panels and sandbags for protection. The solidarity of the whole world coming together to protect culture in Ukraine in times of war is unprecedented in scale. The Heritage Emergency Response Initiative, briefly Harry, was launched to respond to this crisis, and I'm happy to be a co-founder of this initiative. Its goals are to promote and contribute to the preservation of cultural heritage during wartime, of course, coordination, assessment, and documentation of losses and damages, also misification and memorialization of war, and what is very important for us even today during the war, ongoing war, we are thinking about what will be in the future. So with, we, we are thinking about post-war recovery, uh, reconstruction and modernization of our culture. Of course, increasing resilience to emergencies and increasing our cultural sector in general. And here you can see some examples of partnerships and actions. We created a wide national network of museums, archives, uh, libraries, partnerships, uh, coordinating our activities with national and international governments and NGOs. Um, and um, the primary founders of Harry were the Maidan Museum and NGO Tustan from Lviv. And of course, we coordinate our activities with Ministry of Culture and other national and international organizations. Here you can see that in the first weeks of the war, uh, the biggest challenge uh, we faced uh, was the need to evacuate the most valuable collections, to save storage and uh, to provide financial and technical support to employees of cultural institutions in the war zone. And we have been constantly monitoring information about the situation and needs in museums, archives, libraries, both individually and at the specially uh, developed uh, digital web platforms. So we have provided uh, since uh, organization a kind of um, organizational assistance, direct operations, consultations to over 300 cultural institutions from 24 regions of Ukraine. And the uh, protection of um, national identity is impossible without supporting people who take care of national heritage. And many of them have found themselves in a particularly desperate situation, forced to leave their homes, 
lost their workplace, some risked their safety to preserve objects of cultural heritage, some have been completely absorbed in volunteering and helping their colleagues, and some even lost their lives protecting cultural heritage. For example, in my museum, out of 50 staff members, eight people are in the front lines at the moment. And to illustrate this, I would like to, to tell you one case, one story about an electric generator. In March 22, the city of Chernihiv um, in North Ukraine nicknamed a museum city because a lot of churches and museums there was sieged by Russian troops. Unable to capture the city, the Russian army heavily shelled it. Like many other civic buildings, uh, the basement of uh, Vasil Tarnovsky Regional Historical Museum turned into a 24 seven uh, bomb shelter. Uh, dozens of town, townspeople were hiding in the museum without electricity, heat, water, food in those days. And to respond to the request to provide them some help, the Harry ordered, uh, received from Italy, one of the first generator, electric generator due to Cultural Heritage International Emergency Force from Italy. As soon as the bridges around Chernihiv were blown up, the generator with fuel and some food was handed by us to volunteers in Kiev who planned to deliver humanitarian aid to Chernihiv by using field roads, hidden field roads, not open roads, and crossing the Desna River. On their way back, the volunteers on the five uh, minivans planned to evacuate uh, more than 100 townspeople, including children from local orphanage. In the village of Yankiv near Chernigiv, uh, Russian troops shelled the column of five volunteers' vans. Four volunteers were injured and three of them killed, including a husband of a Ukrainian parliament member and the 19-year-old girl named Anastasia. Uh, we found the, the site later and brought what has been left from the generator to tell this story at our exhibition, opened recently, Identity War, Power of Cultural Resistance. And you can see the pictures of, uh, from, 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 from the site. So protecting cultural heritage is always quite dangerous and it can cost uh, human, human lives. Uh, also, we, pro we produced a lot of uh, packaging materials and you can see uh, some of uh, materials we got, protection, protecting equipment, and uh, which we got from many international organizations, museums, governments, ICOM, and here you can see very important for us um, message which we have found among the packaging materials from the team of Louvre. Good luck, we are with you. So the such like things are so, so motivating for us and we are grateful to this kind of support. We also provide um, a lot of expeditions all over Ukraine, mostly to, to occupied or to endangered regions. And here you can see uh, some of, some of uh, pictures we provide assessment of damage, aerial photography by drone, make laser scanning for creating 3D models. We rescue objects and record oral stories uh, from the ground. And here you can see also one of our field trips, including iChrome and iCommerce uh, teams. And we, we also created um, a mobile application for damage and risk assessment on the JotForm platform. So it's very, very instrumental for us at the moment. And also um, here's an example uh, of the 3D model. Unfortunately, it, it is not working here, but uh, we create AR and VR reality models and 3D models. Uh, so they will help us also to monitor the situation of the buildings to <clears throat> provide action plans to stabilize them. And later, of course, they will be very important for reconstruction processes. Um, also, uh, some example of our rescue operations, uh, you have seen on the announcement of this lecture, uh, this famous in Ukraine uh, ceramic rooster. And uh, we, one of the first, our uh, cultural operation to the air-bombed uh, town of Borodyanka near Kiev, and we 
rescued the world known at the moment kitchen cabinet with ceramic rooster, uh, a symbol of Ukrainian resilience. And it, the only one object survived in that building and we documented it and um, have, have, have a fantastic materials uh, to, to, to share, to display. Also quite important for us is to provide uh, uh, education consultations to Ukrainian army on protecting cultural property in times of war according to 1954 Hague Convention and its protocols. And you can see some results. Uh, we, at least we have three cases since 2022, uh, recorded when Ukrainian soldiers saved ecological findings during military actions and pass them to the museums. Of course, we have a lot of challenges and uh, most of them are well discussed and we try to, to respond to them. We need crisis management leadership, of course, we need coordination, we need a lot of very important things. And I'll, uh, so we, we work over this and uh, we hope, uh, we look into the future with a hope. Um, working on establishing of a cultural emergency response and resilience system. You can see just a draft of our vision uh, to respond to the challenges. And of course, uh, there are a lot of things to do, a lot of things uh, which should be done and starting from very simple on a tactical level and finalizing on a strategic level. At the moment, we are working over strate st strategic plan for recovery, strategic plan for cultural emergency response system in Ukraine, harmonization of Ukrainian uh, cultural legislation to international laws, creating on the mobile groups and documenting crimes and trying and, and, and helping ICC, International Criminal Court with this, uh, trying to digitize not only movable but uh, immovable cultural objects. So a lot of things um, should be done at the moment and international uh, expertise, international um, capacities in this uh, crucial for us. And um, uh, to conclude, because I know that um, I'm, I'm running out of my time, um, you can see that basic actions needed. Um, uh, but uh, I have to conclude finally, and uh, I'd like to express uh, my strongest belief that culture has the power to inspire hope it change the world around us. We only have to be united in our minds and actions. And let me paraphrase uh, Malala Yousafza, a young Pakistani social activist and Nobel Prize winner who said one book, one pen, one child, one teacher, and I would add one cultural institution can change the world. And for Ukrainian culture, this dramatic time of the war for identity becomes an opportunity to regain our historical memory, rediscover our cultural identity, make our heritage well protected and accessible to the rest of the world. And of course, for us, it's a chance to tell our story of fighting for freedom and the future. Thank you so much for your attention and for standing with Ukraine. Wow. Uh, thank you, Ihor. The, your lecture is just quite overwhelming. Um, you know, I was, I, so many questions came up to my mind, and I see we have a few in the Q&A already. Um, you know, I was struck by your labeling the war as an identity war. Um, and also, I saw that one of our audience audience members, Terry Shinkman, suggested that it be characterized as a brutal, illegal invasion. Um, but I'm just, uh, I mean, clearly the, the, the Russian theft and destruction of Ukrainian cultural heritage from ancient artifacts to modern materials, museums, archives, cultural sites uh, is intentional. It's an effort to destroy um, and take ownership of Ukrainian identity and cultural memory. Um, you touched on this, but I'd like it if you could expand a little bit on um, the reaction to this among the Ukrainian people. Uh, is it 
um, strengthening the this remarkable resistance that we've witnessed over the past year? Uh, for Ukraine, for uh, for many Ukrainians, um, this war, especially its uh, full uh, full scale st uh, stage, became a kind of um, a shock, a shock, and like a catharsis, because uh, and 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 also a great chance and many motivation to rediscover um, the historical memory, to rediscover their identity, not only cultural but also national and even individual, especially for those people uh, for those communities who lived uh, for decades or even centuries uh, under domination of uh, the Bolshevik, Soviet, or Russian propaganda. And uh, rediscovering, since uh, regaining Ukraine's independence in 1991, um, a lot of information and a lot of cultural uh, facts, cultural treasures, cultural objects, which were imprisoned for decades and even centuries, became open to public. A lot of history, historic and documents became, became open. And so the process of really understanding and understanding our past uh, started. And uh, of course, uh, the processes like the communization, uh, trying to get rid of those propaganda and cliche and all the stereotypes and all the myths which were created and, 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 and substituted the real story, the real history, the real, um, because you know that we have uh, about um, a lot of historians speak about Ukraine that we have for centuries just to survive because we had every century we had we had like like, like uh, the communist time regime 1930s we had those communist repressions in 1918 1921 we had Ukrainian revolution and not many people know about this the the, the whole of the world even celebrates the Russian revolution in 1917 but in fact. It was attempts uh, for, of Ukraine to gain its independence in 1918, 1921, and the rest of the world did not support it. And it's interesting that uh, even uh, speaking about the culture in 1918, uh, the Ukrainian government by Petlura, for example, they sent a special choir uh, with a special cultural dip diplomacy mission to Europe and even United States. And Mikola Leontovich, composer, young composer, um, his music was played because this choir had a mission to tell the story about Ukraine. Ukraine is not Russia. Ukraine is independent nation with, 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 a, with a centuries old uh, history and their own personal cultural identity. And this choir performed the concerts and this Mikola Leontovich was killed uh, by uh, the NKVD, uh, Russian agent in 1921. And uh, one of the famous uh, uh, music by Lentovich, uh, Shedrik, today it is well known as Carol of the Bell. So the whole of the world knows Carol of the Bell, but they do not know the story. Similar was in Ukraine. We just revealed our history recently, 30 years ago, when Ukraine became, they regained independence. So for many people try this, you know, when people started to wake up, they really, try to understand what's going on. And Russian propaganda, of course, they were targeted on identity because on the one hand, they said that we are one nation, we are one people. On the other hand, they understand that our cultural identity, that's the, what keeps us absolutely different. And, and, and they try to destroy this by destroying people, peers of our intangible culture, and of course, tangible. So for us, it's quite clear, that's why we speak about 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 identity war because uh, uh, Putin did not need new territories. The Russia is so huge country. They don't need only our territories or resource, resources in Eastern Ukraine. They want to conquer Ukraine and to re regain uh, a new kind of Soviet Union because as he admitted, it was his personal biggest tragedy. And it was, a, according to him, the biggest geopolitical uh, mistake of the world when the Soviet Union collapsed. So it's 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 quite clear for us why why this war is is identity war. Let me follow up with a question about the um, the actual sort of success you might say of the Russian attempt uh, to appropriate 
Ukrainian cultural heritage and artifacts and the involvement of the professional uh, level of uh, expertise that's gone into this. Often people assume that in context of war, plunder is uh, some kind of random, and, and as you clearly said, um, this one is not a random kind of assault. So I wonder if you could say some something about the uh, the success the 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 success that that Russia has um, accomplished in this sphere, as opposed. To, I mean, people have um, said much about Russia's military miscalculations and deficiencies, but here in the cultural sphere, they seem to have ha had, as you say, a strategy in place that is um, um, that has been um, despite um, you know dis despite chaos um, uh, uncannily effective and uh, so I wonder if you could you could say a little bit about the actors involved in planning and executing this um, initiative in fact uh, according to to the information we we gather and analyze uh, there are uh, so, uh, some damage caused, of course, is is random and damage because of military actions. But not. The, but according to even international analysts, international our international colleagues, there is information that in Ukraine uh, uh, where uh, operate uh, several groups of uh, experts for hunting for for definite types of uh, historical crashes, objects, art items um, from different points of view. For example, uh, some groups are hunting for art paintings, for paintings, for example, by artists who, whose origin can be disputed so that Russia can claim that they are not Ukrainian, they are Russian artists. For example, uh, I, I mentioned um, uh, before, for example, uh, Archip Kuinji or Ivan Ivasovsky, people of maybe Armenian origin, or people who were born in Russia, or Tatiana Yablonska, for example, or Mykola Glushenko, some people who were born in Eastern Ukraine, who were born in Russia, or worked in Ukraine and identified themselves as Ukrainians. So Russia claimed that they are Russian artists. And they loot this collection, they relocate and say, okay, they are not our. And we know that even internationally, there, are, there is an uh, interesting process when uh, when the Metropolitan, for example, museum and in, in, in many European museums, uh, Stedlik Museum, for example, they try to identify and saying that they're not Russian artists, but Ukrainian, like Malevich, like Esther. And so, so this is a, one kind of, 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 of direction. The other direction is, of course, uh, some monetary and historical values. So people would like to get the most precious, like Skitty and gold. Skitty and gold very important for Russia, and maybe you know that suit, uh, the so-called uh, uh, Skiffin Gold suits in in the Netherlands, that collection in Alec Pearson Museum, uh, disputed gold from Crimea, and Ukraine finally won that suit, and that collection will return not to occupied Crimea, but to Ukraine. Also, there are a lot of um, private uh, groups who are looking only to monetary, for example, archaeological, black archaeologists, very active. They were quite, quite active before the large scale aggression because the, the Eastern Ukraine, especially the border of military action, the Siversky Donetsk River, a lot of burial mounds there. And so the black archaeologists work so intensively there now, and we cannot, we don't know what's going on there. And a lot of individual looters, like soldiers, who loot uh, museums, uh, cultural institutions. A <clears throat> lot uh, uh, private collection in the houses, and uh, in Belarusia there is a kind of a flea market, where um, uh, people saw not only average objects which Russian soldiers sell as a trophy, but also art objects from private collections and from public collections. So there are a lot of and and we work a lot uh, together now to launch the process. For example, the red list, the ICOM red list for Ukraine was issued for auction houses, for Interpol, for, for borders. Uh, also, we work with ICC, with other groups, uh, trying to create a database on the looted objects. So, so uh, the process is very complicated. And, uh, and some groups at the moment think about 
repatriation and restitution, what we should do. It's a very uh, complicated pro process, um, but, but still we ha have hope that it will be successful. Um, I'm, I have another question, and, and fortunately, it, 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 a similar question just popped up into the question and answer box. But I also want to ask you, and, and another question came in that you may not be able to answer right now, but maybe we could do this through email later. Um, one of our um, audience members was interested in the source of your statement by uh, Piotr Trokovsky. I, if you don't know that right away, we can maybe um email and and whoever asked that question could email me on and you can find my address on our website and um we could uh try to get that to you um do you have an answer to that or should we... yeah concerning concerning oh. the statement you can find the online because it, it was a kind of a, a scandal concerning this uh you can see you, you can find it uh in open sources in internet so icom ukraine even issued a special statement concerning this so it's easily, easily, you can easily find in open sources. Okay. Um, I was going to save this till the very, till the very end, but um, since it came up in, in the question in, in, um, box, um, I'll ask it. Um, I, I'm just really struck by the amount of work that you're doing, the documentation, um, even laser scanning of damage, uh, developing this red list of objects. Clearly, there's a lot going on um, to prepare for the aftermath of this war the, um, during recovery stages and even criminal prosecution um, in international courts. Is um, so it, and, and I'm struck by the amount of help you're getting by international NGOs. And I know that the Getty just provided, the Getty Foundation just provided a million dollars, and, and others have as well. How can individuals? Um, educators and and artists and conservators and 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 others um help in your current effort um are there in, in addition to sending money i suppose there, there might be some uh, places where we could just send checks but also is there other other things that we could be doing uh there are quite uh, a number uh, quite a big number of uh, different um, coalitions uh, for example, I, uh, ICOM, ICOMUS, um, UNESCO. Uh, so we work in groups, in clusters. Uh, so you can join and see what kind of projects are provided because since uh, for, for one year, uh, this cluster has already been formed and they're specializing in different kind of help. Uh, for example, World Monument Fund, quite active. Global Heritage Fund provided uh, together with Alif and um, and um, Europa Nostra uh, funds uh, for supporting individual uh, cultural uh, cultural people only only individual. Uh, there are some uh, clusters or coalitions who work over stabilization efforts. You can find some information on the website of Ukrainian Ministry of Culture. How is it possible to to donate uh, money or resources or expertise? How to join the initiative. Also, you can find uh, us, uh, Harry, on uh, social media. We, we will launch uh, the website soon in, uh, in a month. So we will provide uh, all information, what kind of initiative already operates today in Ukraine uh, and, and abroad to help Ukraine. But in fact, there are a lot of uh, levels. Uh, for example, uh, in Lugano, uh, our government president uh, presented uh, the plan for recovery and it will be a conference in London very soon also about recovery plan for Ukraine and cultural heritage and cultural sector will be included first time there so it will be also a great uh, chance to understand uh, what what are the priorities and how possible to join uh, on, on, on different levels on a funding level on expertise level um, so so thank you so much uh, for for this question because we we got so many questions like this, in, even in the first day of full-scale aggression, how we can help you. It was not easy to answer us in that time, but much easier today. Maybe I'll follow up on that with another question regarding um, international assistance and initiatives. Uh, there's a question in the, in the uh, audience, from the audience about ICOM 
uh, Germany's call to ban ICOM Russia members and whether or not cultural heritage should be used to build bridges or uh, in fact, if the travesties being committed by Russia so are so extreme that a stance needs to be taken by the world community. So I wonder if you could comment on whether or not legal sanctions of any kind, we have international treaties that are not being observed, um, how you see the international community and some of these legal sanctions or official organizations can contribute to the um, initiatives that you have on the ground. For us, uh, for us, it's very, very painful uh, subject uh, because we were very surprised that uh, no voice concerning this war from the cultural sector uh, from Russia, even ICOM Russia, is quite uh, silent in this situation. And of course, we would like to, to make bridges, uh, but in this situation, it's looked like a big uh, hypocrisy because, because uh, there is a there, there, is, there is a systematic destruction uh, of Ukrainian cultural heritage and ICOM, or, or museums, for example, you have seen the statistics, but ICOM Russia is just so silent and, and silence in many cases means agree that just support of the official Putin's policy. So banning, um, uh, banning, banning uh, Russian cultural uh, um, participation or presence in, in, on the international level it's also one of the uh, one of the kinds of 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 how to say of, of the international voice. What can be done? Because not international international community cannot done a lot in this situation. But when there will be a kind of a position that it should be it, it should not be done in this way. Something should be changed, and uh, we should of course sit at, at, at the table, but not now. Not when the aggression. Is not is not completing. It's 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 either uh, vice versa. It's ongoing. It's developing. And for us, it's a, it, it's it's a devastation. It's such a big tra tragedy on the one hand, and on the other hand, so we understand that we should we should understand the reason why it happens, and what should be done. All all those sides who are directly or indirectly a part of this war. I mean, initiated this war should be punished or this or that way, or, or isolated. In, in terms of that, maybe um, as we get towards the end of the discussion, I could ask you a little bit about resistance on the ground in the cultural sphere. And I, I think it has uh, two dimensions, um, perhaps you could comment on. The first is the dimension of just ordinary people. What are they seizing on to express their affiliation, identity, they're emerging new cultural um, um, persona, <laughs> as you, you know, as you, as you, uh, um, as you have told us so well, Ukrainian culture is in process. And I'm wondering how people are expressing that on the ground. And the other part of that question, of course, is how artists themselves are involved in um, confronting this situation at the moment? Uh, speaking about local communities, they, they, uh, many of them uh, are so active and they participate in the process of developing uh, our cultural heritage in, the, in, the, in the resilient, resilient forms. For example, in many cases of the cultural uh, infrastructure damaged, uh, the local people were main actors because they helped to evacuate uh, famous artworks, for example, in Ivankiv, uh, the collection of Maria Paramachenko was rescued due to local people and in many other situations. Even in occupied Donetsk uh, in 2014, that Donetsk Museum was damaged and local people, not thinking about any politi politics, they just helped museum staff to evacuate 18 galleries damaged by Russian shelling. Uh, speaking about artists, artists are in avant-garde of uh, creating identity of this resilience. And so they organize exhibitions, they work abroad. I mean, uh, they, they, they develop a lot of joint international and national art projects. And uh, for example, our even culture institutions try to be very resilient and active even in times of war, in times of constant everyday alarms. Uh, because they evacuated collections and their galleries are empty. 
but they organize new exhibitions, they organize educational programs, they try to be helpful for local communities, providing tokens to them, trying to take off these traum traumatic elements, trying to talk to them. And the mo most of the museums are open to public and we can see a lot of people visiting museums. So there is a big demand for cultural life in Ukraine, even in times of war. So this makes um, our cultural sector quite resilient because we understand what are the real needs and how people really appreciate and, uh, and, 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 evalu and not evaluate, but they feel that this is a very important part of their own human life, their essence, their soul. And so it's, it's a very important part uh, for Ukrainian cultural heritage and cultural sector uh, to, to have the second, uh, second, how to say, uh, push of development and modernization and rethinking their missions and, uh, and, and, and strategies. One future. of the things, yeah, one of the things that has struck me about the work of young Ukrainian artists at this moment is that the form of resistance they're engaging in is also a resistance to extreme ethno-nationalism on all sides and their effort to um, to forge a new identity, not only for themselves, but in reaction to events in other parts of Europe as well, as a, a pluralistic and multicultural and non-exclusive kind of a new identity that really incorporates sectors of Ukrainian society that might not even have been incorporated before. And of course, of the international community and reaching out across borders. So they are a striking um, young generation of creators. And it's interesting to see how important the cultural sector has become in this particular moment that we consider to be you know, political. Well, we are a few minutes over. Uh, maybe we should end with that um, positive um, thought. And uh, certainly we've, we've had a resurgence of Ukrainian music and dance and art exhibits in Southern California over the last year, which uh, many of us have been attending. Um, there is one, one other question Maybe I'll just try to quickly answer that about um, treating damaged Ukrainian cultural materials post-war. Um, I think, you know, there, I would like to hope that there will be a lot of efforts um, among conservators around the world to help in the um, uh, conservation repair of um, damaged artifacts. Um, so we can all look forward to that, to getting to that point. Um, so Ihor, I would just like to thank you um, for that really impactful uh, lecture and, and discussion. And to Lori and the Center for European and Russian Studies for co-hosting this event. And I'd also like to thank those that have provided financial support for our program and this distinguished lecture series. The support helps us create this programming and um, provide opportunities for our students as well who are engaged in researching critical issues in the conservation of cultural heritage. So thank you all. Um, as a reminder, the a recording of the lecture will be posted on our website. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.